Happy New Year. Let's cut down some nets. This is cutting down the nets. We've got over 20 games in the pool today, but we'll filter that down quite a bit because uh, there's some interesting situations out there. So it should be fun. It's good to be back home and ready to dig into games for the year. 240 and 183 for 56.7, 11 11, the last seven days. Once we have this one day off from last week drop off, uh, that'll be back to normal. So let's get to it. There is a lot of action today. What I would watch for is as I go through each game, make notes on which games you would want to bet if you got the line movement you wanted before tip and which ones I think are unaffected by line movement. It's more of a matchup problem. So just something to note. Look, I'm not perfect. No one's perfect when they bet sports, but um, I'm looking for those little edges here and there, and hopefully we'll stumble upon them today. First game, Memphis, Wichita State. This, with Memphis favored, would be a play for me. So if Wichita State was getting any points at all, I would play it. Um, I do think it's close. I think Wichita State can turn over Memphis, but the only ball handler I trust on Wichita is Etienne. So um, it looks like all three players that missed the last game for Memphis, uh, which caused them to lose the game, traveled with the team. I think... I don't think Bates plays, but I think the other two play. Uh, I think it's kind of inconsequential given the line. So I'm going to watch this one and not bet it. But if uh, if Wichita State was getting some points, you'll likely see that show up in bet stamp. All right. Baylor travels to Hilton Coliseum to take on Iowa State, the biggest surprise of the year. TJ Ultabrun finding his Dakota Magic after losing it. In Vegas. So, data says Iowa State, and it's not close. My eyes say, oh my God, I can't imagine betting against Baylor versus uh, a team that's probably overvalued in Iowa State, but they've earned it. They've earned it. So, Iowa State has got it done with defense. It's going to be a crazy environment there. Their home crowd always shows up uh, real strong, but ISU's running real pure with three point defensive luck. And now you're facing Baylor. Uh, so major concerns for the ISU offense in this spot as well. So really what this came down to for me is, is just the amount of value that's there is making this a play. But I don't, I don't feel good about it um, at all. But eight points at home. Um, and Iowa State's shown it. It's not like they're a surprise undefeated team that um, got through the non-con untouched. I mean... They've dusted some pretty damn good teams. So um, eight points is the story here. More than the matchups and anything get over eight is good. I mean, nine and a half would be like a dream, but that's not going to happen. Um, Matthew Mayer may miss, and I'm afraid if he misses, um, we lose a little bit of value there. So just something to note. Um, tried to time this video perfect. No one wants to watch it. Like. Uh, hanging out at a New Year's Eve party or anything like that and uh, let the people sleep in a little bit today. Next game, Wake Forest, Miami. This is a pretty even matchup. However, I do have Wake as just the more complete team, the more consistent team, but this will come down to Wake making threes. So that's why it's in the yellow. Um, that's just how it's going to go. That's how Miami matches up stylistically with uh, where they funnel shots to and Wake Forest will oblige. But I still um, like the Deacons here. Um, two of my favorite coaches, too, Steve Forbes and Jim Lernig. Okay, Creighton Marquette. This one is uh, a little different because this was originally a play because – or it wasn't a play and it became a play because now Marquette is favored. So Marquette getting touted. And I understand why. Because Creighton has struggled versus similar defenses. But the Marquette offense is really struggling. And a key player, Daryl Morcel, is doubtful. 
So it's it's interesting, but um, and here's the deal: Creighton's turned it over a lot this year and still performed fine in those games. I don't think it certainly adds an advantage to you, but uh, even games where they're getting turned over, um, they they have still scored. So I don't know. It's it's interesting, but it's an orange for a reason, and. Um, would have to be getting more points to back Creighton there. Okay, Providence to Paul. Uh, you'll notice my my numbers on the far right. That's the variance between spread and what the uh, efficiency model produced. This is probably one of the lower games you'll see me go after on a normal Saturday slate. And I'm not sold on either offense, but the Providence defense is just on a heater. And this DePaul team, if they're not in transition is is just like hero ball. Um, they are 338th in assist rate. So I'm just counting on Ed Cooley here to force um, DePaul into the half-court offense, and I, uh, that would shape up very well for Providence. If DePaul can get up and up and down, a uh, far different story. But um, I don't know. Ed's been doing this a long time, and I like my odds there. Next game, Vermin. <laughs> Vermin. <laughs> Furman. Versus VMI, um, could see seventy three pointers. I almost put eighty there because I think it's possible, but I don't know if the pace gets up enough for eighty. But uh, both teams in that fifty percent range for three point rate. That's not fifty uh, percent makes. That means half their shots are three pointers. And when both teams are like that, um, yeah, there's a lot of variance here. So how do you handle a game like this? I'm going to stay away. But given that I have VMI as close to a pick em, in a high variance game like this, I think if you bet it, you just go VMI money line and hope that you're on the right side of variance. So in high variance games, I think dog money lines have some value. Okay, Toledo, Kent State. This is a tough one. I've seen some smart people this morning on the Kent State side. I see that the line has moved that way. Look, seasons have ebbs and flows. Sometimes um, a team kind of bottoms out and then bounces back, um, typically at home, which is where Kent State is. But there is not a single data point in Kent State's profile that has me encouraged for where they're heading. And when your model is built on recent efficiency, (laughs) it's not going to look good for Kent State. So um, rivalry, uh, conference game, I, I look, I get it, but um, I don't play narratives. I play the data, and data has the Rockets here, so that is on my card. Next game is very interesting. This is Western Illinois against St. Thomas. We have backed uh, St. Thomas profitably against some pretty bad teams um, over the last few weeks. This is a little different story today. This is interesting. So St. Thomas is second in three-point rate. I think it's 52% of their shots are three-pointers. But Western Illinois is running people off the three-point line. They're fourth in three-point rate defense. So only 26% of their opponent shots are behind the arc. That has forced teams into a bunch of long twos. Uh, The Tommies are a good shooting team, whether it's long twos or threes. They just refuse to shoot long twos, like refuse. Um, I think 13% of their shots are long twos. That's that's a coaching thing. That's that's what a lot of these rim and three coaches are focused on. They even set up practice courts to uh, discourage anything inside the three-point line. Um, big size advantage for Western Illinois. Um, but Western Illinois is also a three-point reliant team. St. Thomas does oblige there. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how St. Thomas will react. Uh, their coach has been running a similar style for many years, which vaulted this program from D3 to D1. And I'm sure he's dealt with people running off three-point line before. So I'm going Thomas. Bowling Green Ball State showed up as a data play. Uh, should be up-tempo. Two bad teams. I'm just not seeing enough there to want to go there. Uh, Western Kentucky against Louisiana Tech. Western Kentucky 
One of the few low variance teams in college basketball is they don't shoot a lot of threes, but uh, Louisiana Tech does, and they're going to get some looks here as Western Kentucky kind of funnels to that area of the court. Um, I'm fine with that at home, looking for a Louisiana Tech ceiling here, lane five and a half, but um, no clear edges, and I've got it at nine, so I'll take it. Virginia Syracuse. This is uh, interesting to me because when you think pack line defense, you think three point shooting teams shooting over it. And when you think Syracuse and their matchup zone, you think teams shooting over it. So if I had to guess, I would say Syracuse just torches Virginia historically. And I think historically is a way to look at this game because of just the unique styles that they play. Like this is their identity. This is what they do. And any game they play typically comes down to how you match up against what they do. So what's interesting here is Virginia has been torching Syracuse, which I found surprising. But um, yeah, Syracuse typically has uh, bad shooting days when they play Virginia and Virginia shoots lights out from three pointers. Now who's, who's going to do that? Virginia, P.A. Clark. <laughs> I don't know. So Dana said Syracuse, but there's enough history here that I'm like, I'll just sit that one out. I was surprised by that. Uh, New Mexico and Nevada. This is a good play on paper, but I think it comes down to size and Nevada's seven footers. Um, just probably too much. And New Mexico State's interior defense. Um, not a strength. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to sit that one out. Uh, Northern Colorado Bears for Southern Utah. There are matchup edges for Southern Utah on turnovers and rebounds. And, and here's the deal. The Northern Colorado is good enough. Uh, I don't want you to think they're an elite shooting team, but they're good enough offensively to score. But when you're limited to one shot or you turn it over before you get a shot, you're asking a lot of your shooters to make that happen. So data suggests this play, but that's where the matchup can cause concern. This game was off Eastern Washington and Northern Arizona line movement towards Northern Arizona. Put this in play for Eastern Washington. It's a bit thin, but um, looking at matchups, nothing stands out all that much. Northern Arizona, uh, rough basketball team. Eastern Washington has picked it up as of late. Um, Tarlington State, Utah Valley. This one's interesting. I, yeah, we'll just do it. We'll do it right here. We'll make it, we'll make it yellow. <laughs> uh, here's why. There is a massive turnover edge for Tarleton. Uh, Utah Valley sloppy with the ball. Tarleton um, forces a lot of turnovers. Let me see if I can just pull that game up as well. I think that's worth looking into. Here's Tarleton, and we'll run over to Mark Madsen's Utah Valley. Okay, so our old friend Billy. Here's what their profile looks like. You see a slight trend up in offense, and it's because they stopped missing 13 threes a game. So, all right, have they turned a corner? Did the, that, That's why I talk about three-point luck. Um, Sometimes it just regresses towards the mean. But this really comes down to the matchup. Tarleton, forcing turnovers on 25.1% of their possessions. Utah Valley, protecting the ball poorly. Uh, so 293rd in offensive turnover rate. Possession-wise, 65 pace for Utah. 61 pace. Tarleton. If neither team forced turnovers and played a pack line defense, I would say elite grinding, but this is going to be a slow game where one team is going to fail to get a shot off frequently. So um, that, that interests me. I just think that is, that's, that's the game right there. Like that's the, that's what you look for. So um, yeah, we'll make that yellow. and. You know what? We'll go ahead and add that to our card after the show. Abilene Christian, Dixie State. This is a perfect spot 
for Abilene. And here's why. The game will be fast. So 70-plus possession pace for both teams. Abilene Christian thrives off forcing turnovers. Other than that, they struggle offensively. Um, if you watch them in the big dance against Texas, that's them. It's ugly ball, but, um, man, it's, it's kind of fun to watch. So they're facing a Dixie State team that plays fast. That's check one because we can get enough possessions there. Um, sloppy at the ball. That's check two. And then is just awful defensively. So that's check three. So for me, if Abilene is facing a team that was strong defensively, I mean, they're going to have to get layups from their turnovers just because they really struggle offensively. Um, if they were playing a team that really protected the ball but was weak defensively, it'd be like, well, they're not going to get the turnovers they need, so they're going to need to run pretty pure on the offensive side. So in this case, fast pace, sloppy, and um, a poor defense is, is just a good matchup for Abilene. Uh, Navy, Holy Cross, Holy Cross, Holy Crap. It's, uh, it's a bad team looking at their data, but I think you're asking a lot of Navy to cover double digits <laughs> on the road against anybody. Um, it is a decent matchup for Navy, though. I don't want to sell this short. Like it's, it's in play, and that's a game where if, um, yeah, on a Saturday, New Year's Day, there's not going to be a lot of line movement on Navy Holy Cross. But if that line got shorter, I'd be interested in it. Nebraska Omaha Oral Roberts was a play for Oral Roberts. That line's kind of got out of control there. So we'll sit that out. And then Idaho State, Montana State. Uh, good spot here for the Bobcats. But um, Idaho State plays so slow that that is adding. Um, just it makes it a lot harder. When when one team is, is really slowing down, you, you're just asking a lot to cover. 12 and a half. So that's it. Let's let's recap this a little bit. Memphis, Wichita State. I need Wichita State to get points to be on that side. Baylor, Iowa State. Man, um, I went through that. It is is what it is. Wake, Miami. I'm fine at current number. Would obviously love more. Okay. So this Creighton Marquette. I mean, anything under one and a half for Creighton, I'd, I'd sit out. Like, this is on the fence, as is right now. And um, I probably need a full point or more, and I don't think you're going to get it. Uh, Providence, DePaul, it's a little bit of the danger zone here with, with the two-and-a-half point value. I'm backing Providence, but um, just be wary if, if when you go to bet, it's like two-and-a-half points that the value is like almost gone. Furman, VMI. Um, too much variance for me to bet the spread, but I do think there's a decent payoff for VMI money line. Toledo Kent State went through that. I'm comfortable with that game. Western Illinois St. Thomas, man, that's a weird one. I'm excited to see how that plays out and how the Tommies perform. Um, sitting out, Bowling Green Ball State, Louisiana Tech, I am fine with Virginia Syracuse. No amount of line movement would get me sucked in to that, given the history of the programs. Same with New Mexico, Nevada. Like even if I saw an eleven and a half or twelve, I just think the size and matchup is rough there. However, Northern Colorado, Southern Utah, we're right at the cusp right here. Um, if I saw a seven, I'd I'd fire a plus seven on Northern Colorado, and it's possible a six and a half makes it onto my card. Eastern Washington, the line has already moved this way, so there could be some buyback and. Um, would not be interested in Eastern Washington as a favorite at all. So dog only there. Tarleton, Utah Valley. We added that uh, as we talked through it. And I'm fine there. I, I like that spot. And getting more than two possessions in a game like that is nice. Uh, Abilene Christian, no concerns there. Let's go. And then, um, yeah, it takes some line movement to want to back Navy here. And same with Montana State. That has my pool at Baylor, Toledo, Louisiana Tech, Abilene Christian, St. Thomas, Eastern Washington, Wake Forest, Providence, and let's not forget, Tarleton State is joining the card. I will 
um, potentially make other plays depending on movement. So as always, you can follow me on BetStamp, user ID, CD, TN. It's good to be back. It's January 1st. It looks like maybe fewer and fewer college basketball games cancel on the horizon. Something to watch for over the next week or so is the amount of time the team has spent on COVID pause is a thing. And last year, um, pauses of two weeks was about three points. I hate handicapping and adding in COVID pauses in the crap. I just just want a normal season so bad. So it looks like we're trending that way. But we're going to have some teams coming off some lengthy pauses, and that has been very detrimental the first game back and, in some cases, um, subsequent games as well. Uh, affected Baylor for like a month, and then they won the national championship when I was on full Baylor fade. So shit happens. All right. So thanks for stopping by. Good luck.